Hey everybody, Hoosier Jedi here with another review for you. This time I'm going to be reviewing the movie Iron Man 3. I happen to live in South Korea, if you're not one of my regular viewers. And the movie came out here two days ago. I went and saw it with some of my friends last night. And overall, I think it's a pretty darn good movie. It's uh, certainly a very enjoyable Marvel movie, and I did have quite a bit of fun watching it. Now that said, it's not th is this movie doesn't have some flaws in it. So what I'm going to do in this review is talk about some of my feelings on both the good and bad aspects of the story and what I thought was going on, good and bad, with the characters. Now to do this, I am, of course, going to have to bring out quite a few spoilers. So if you don't want to be spoiled for the movie, now would be the time to turn away. Okay, now with that said, let's just get right into it. My main complaint with this movie is that the middle really seemed to drag at times. It just really, really slowed down way too much. You know, particularly in the events following the Mandarin's attack on Tony's house. You know, for there, for like what seemed like maybe 20 minutes, half an hour, the movie was just really just sort of going along at a snail's pace. Now, of course, it did pick up, and we were treated to a reasonably satisfying conclusion at the end, but still, well, that middle part, huh? But um, let's come back to that later. Right now, let's sort of jump right into the characters and talk about what's going on with them, because that's, of course, why I come to these movies, is because I'm a fan of the comics, and I love the characters and all that. Now, I have read the Extremis story arc once, years ago, when it was first collected. And to be perfectly honest with you, I only remember like a handful of details about it. So, um, there's really nothing for me to go by in terms of comparing this to the story in the comics. Uh, one thing though is of course that Extremis was written by a British writer by the name of Warren Ellis, of whom I'm a big fan. He's a very, very talented fellow. And of course, if you were paying attention, you noticed that uh, might have noticed that the president was named President Ellis. Obviously, in a tip of the hat to the esteemed Mr. Warren Ellis. Very, very cool dude. Um, really, folks, you read just about anything he's written. Comics, novels, he's done both. He's just a very talented fella. So anyway, let's get right into it. Um, of course, we have to talk about our lead character, Tony Stark, a.k.a. Iron Man. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold, so my voice is uh, still a little messed up. Now, a lot of folks were talking uh, before this movie came out wondering, like, what's going to be going on with Tony in terms of what had happened with the Avengers movie? A lot of people were worried about that they were just going to kind of gloss that over. Well, I like the fact that they flat out did not. I mean, it is blatantly obvious that Tony has post-traumatic stress disorder from almost dying at the end of Avengers. I mean, he's having panic attacks, having nightmares. It's it's a perfectly logical thing to have happen to his character. And the way that he deals with it, you know, just burying himself in his work. And now that Tony's stepped away from the booze, that's really all he's got going for him in terms of how to cope. I mean, this is totally, totally the sort of thing that Tony Stark does. We've seen him do exactly this thing a hundred times in the comics. And what's really great, of course, is just the performance that Robert Downey Jr. puts in there. Like, Tony is a guy who, when he's got a problem, he's used to, as as I said, he's a mechanic. He, he fixes things. He's used to being able to go out there with his hands and deal with his problems. You know, find a solution. And when he can't do that, he just sort of tends to blow things off. But now Tony's got a thing, a problem, in his own head. He can't walk away from that. He That's going with him wherever he goes. He can't stick his head, it hands inside of his own head, and fix the problem. And this is why, really, this is so hard for Tony to deal with. You know, Tony is a guy of supreme ego. And to realize that this vulnerability is within him, that's a hard thing to deal with. And then there's just the sheer coming to the fact that he is indeed mortal. That he had this incredibly close brush with death that he was going to, he thought he was going to die a million miles away from the one person in his life that he loved more than anybody and even then in his last moments he was trying to reach out to pepper and he couldn't i mean it is no wonder that it leaves such a mark on him 
And, you know, I, I like how the story of this, well, to be perfectly fair, you know, this is not the sort of thing where one little thing makes all of Tony's post-traumatic stress disorder go away. I mean, that is, in, in the real world, kind of a ridiculous thing. But here we see Tony really, you know, beaten down, left with just really the clothes on his back and a beat-up suit of Iron Man armor that barely functions, if at all. And he still manages to come back from that. He comes back, wins the day, and it really does, both literally and figuratively, get him back his heart. And I thought that was really, at the end, wonderfully well done. You know, in terms of just uh, storytelling and the symbolism of it all, and just the way that Robert Downey Jr. narrates that scene. And, then, and of course, all of the acting that he did through this movie. You can tell that this guy just absolutely gets the biggest kick in the world out of out of being Tony Stark. And that's as it should be, because nobody in the world gets a bigger kick out of being Tony Stark than Tony Stark. <coughs> um, I wasn't so thrilled with all that stuff with uh, Tony and the kid, Harley. Uh, that That's one of the things that, to me, really dragged the movie down the most. It sort of felt like the sort of thing that really should have been in some other movie. I mean, come on, how many times have we seen that sort of thing? Like, you know, the beaten down hero gets rescued by some kid and they bond and blah, 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 blah. I mean, really, we've seen that a million times. Now, not that it was all bad. Um, You know, you know, we're connected and then, uh, you know, Tony laughs off the kid giving him the puppy dog eyes and then sort of makes fun of him before he drives off. Okay, that was pretty darn satisfying, but... Again, the whole I think they really could have done all that stuff without with Harley and whatnot. Could have been left out. Um now, uh yeah. Uh, other than that, I all I really have to say about Tony as a character is that I really do enjoy his interactions with Pepper as well. You know, he and Pepper argue, they have, you know, serious emotional rifts, like when uh, Tony's armor grabs her while they're while she's sleeping. Although, you know, to be completely fair, Cut, cut the guy a break, Pepper. He's suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. But still, you know, that was just a knee-jerk emotional reaction that Pe Pepper had. It, once she'd had some time to, you know, calm down about it, I think they'd have probably just apologized to each other and would have been all good. But anyway, uh, let's since I brought her up, let's bring up Pepper. Now, Pepper is another one of those things about this movie that I do have to kind of criticize a little bit. Now, when she's there in the movie and she's interacting with Tony... It's, she's actually very interesting. We see them bouncing off each other. As I said, their relationship has its highs and its lows. And it, it feels like a very real relationship. You know, Pepper does really seem like the one woman in the world who genuinely could handle being in a real relationship with Tony Stark. And the way it's portrayed, that Tony is firmly committed to Pepper, that he loves her deeply, that he really does see her as, you know, one of the things that really does help keep him afloat. I mean, that's all sold very well. I mean, Robert Downey Jr. just really knocks that stuff out. And seriously, it was just so much fun watching them, you know, just interact and be together. It was really cool. The only... But the thing is, though, that Pepper is there really at the beginning of the movie, and then she's there at the end. The rest of the middle of the movie, she basically spends as uh, Aldrich Killian's prisoner. And... Uh, it's not really, I think, the best thing that they could have done with her character. I mean, it's basically taking her from... I don't know if I'd exactly say Tony's partner, you know, in the way that War Machine is, but certainly his support. And, uh, you know, and in terms of emotional and, in many ways, you know, technical support. You know, she's a uh, mission control in some ways. She's Tony's... In a way, she's a little bit of a backup for Tony. You know, somebody who can help behind the, behind the scenes for him. Now, um, I did really enjoy the scene where she got to wear the Iron Man's armor, albeit very, very briefly. That's a, a really nice little nod to her storyline in the comics where she gets her own Iron Man armor and, uh, be, well, be, well, they wanted to call her Iron Maiden, but a, a certain metal band, uh, lawyers put the kibosh on that, so she ended up going by the name of Rescue. It was actually still pretty darn cool. Now, the stuff at the end where she gets superpowers and is ultimately the one that kills Aldrich Killian, 
Uh, I kind of got to call BS on that. That just really felt like, oh, it's sort of like, yeah, Pepper's kind of been the damsel in distress, you know. I mean, seriously, he's actually kind of been like Princess Toadstool. Our princess is another castle, you know. Tony trying to find her and all that. And even going to what looks an awful lot like a, ma a mansion that looks an awful lot like a castle, and she's not there. And getting told that she's somewhere by... A rather... T uh, okay. Anyway... So it's like, okay, let's redeem that whole thing by having her, you know, beat up the bad guy and, uh, you know, have her little action hero moment. And it, it just really does not work. Now, Pepper, Pepper just did not have the same sort of stake in taking down Killian that Tony did. Now, granted, I mean, he kidnapped her and experimented on her, but... We'd never spent any time with Pepper to see how she was reacting to this, tell how she was dealing with this whole situation. I mean, at least Tony got a scene where he got to mouth off to Killian and insult him and all this other stuff. Pepper really didn't get that. So, the emotional impact of her being the one that ultimately finishes him off, it just wasn't there. Um, so, I think that's really all I have to say about Pepper. Um... Let's uh, wrap up, I guess, uh, Tony's friends and such uh, from start from the original Stark Enterprises, and let's briefly talk about good old Happy Hogan. Uh, first of all, and I don't really mean this as a criticism, just as an observation, but is it just me or just John Favreau to have seemed to have put on some weight? Uh, anyway, uh, Happy, I, I like Happy as a character. I he was somebody who does need to be in these movies because he's an important part of the Iron Man mythos. And John Favreau did a really great job with him in the first movie. I really enjoyed him there. In the second movie, uh, not so much. But, you know, it was still satisfying at the end to see Happy get to take down that one bodyguard guy. And at least have his, like, yeah, okay, I, s I can still contribute moment. Here, it's just like, <sighs> Happy, come on, man. You know, get your head out of your butt. And the thing is that Happy spends most of the movie completely forgotten about. Honestly, in many ways, the same way as Pepper. We get to see see him at the beginning. He has his little moment where he's able to whammy up a clue for Tony to deal with. And, of course, him getting hurt is a part, big part of uh, Tony's initial decision to get involved in what's going on. And, of course, we get to throw in some references to Downtown Abbey because... That's that's a big thing these days. I don't, I don't know. I've ever watched it. It's just like, oh, that show with uh, Professor McGonagall from Harry Potter. Whatever. Anyway. And then we get to see him wake up at the end because, you know, tying up loose ends and all that. So, yeah. I, I just really wasn't feeling what they were doing with Happy as a character. And uh, speaking of characters that I just really wasn't feeling with, uh, we also have Maya, the uh, scientist lady who helps come up with Extremis and ultimately turns out to be working with AIM and betrays Tony and all this other stuff. Okay, now her being on the side of AIM, you know, remember, this, this was, I looked it up, an aspect of the story in the comics, but as I said, I didn't really remember any of the details from the story that I when I read it, so... That twist, that did genuinely surprise me. But here's the thing. Did you notice that, one, Tony seems to be placing an awful lot of faith in the good nature of a woman who has been, for years, a member of a terrorist organization that has killed unknown, a, large and unknown, a large unknown number of innocent people? I mean, remember, one of the first things the Mandarin does is point out how he blew up deliberately the wives and children of a bunch of soldiers. All right, so Maya was tied to that. I mean, that was done by AIM, and Maya is a member of AIM. So seriously, Maya is coming into this with plenty of blood on her hands. And of course, there's the whole thing of lying to and manipulating and using Tony for her own ends. And then at the very end, she kind of seems to just have that little you know, moral turnaround where she sticks that thing to her neck. So, of course, you know, that doesn't work, and Aldrich Killian just shoots her and kills her. And then everybody promptly forgets about her. I mean, seriously. 
After she dies, not one single word is said about Maya. Again, at all. So, to me, that's just sort of, you know, for her as a character, really. I mean, when you when you when you die and nobody mentions you again for the rest of the movie, yeah, yeah. So, of course, this brings us to Aldrich Killian. Uh, again, he's another character from the storyline, but uh, pardon me. Like I said, I'm still a little stuffed up. Hold on. Here he's uh, <clears throat> taken as in the original story. He was very much a minor character. Here he's radically reinterpreted, and it basically even says at the end of it, I am the Mandarin. He's the guy behind the scenes who's pulling the puppet strings. And I have to say, I like this. It's certainly made things interesting. I've spent most of the movie thinking, like, oh, he's sort of like the, the Mandarin's tech guy, his pet scientist. So him turning out to be the one behind it all, that was genuinely a good twist. I did not see that coming. And you certainly can't say that Guy Pierce doesn't turn in a really nice performance here. Uh, but, one, Aldrich Killian, the way he's decked out, uh, seriously, he sort of looks like a guy who hasn't realized that it's not the 1980s anymore in some ways. I mean, if you change his clothes to something a little bit more let retro, he'd have looked perfectly good as like some sort of sleazy, like drug-dealing uh, rich dude on an old episode of Miami Vice. You know, not quite so at all, if you ask me, that a decent chunk of this movie was set in Miami. I mean, he, seriously, he just sort of looks like that, you know, tanned, blonde jock, that guy that, like, so many of us hated when we were in high school. Like, that guy as an adult. And then there's the stuff at the end where he rips off his shirt, and for no discernible reason, he's got all these dragon tattoos on here. It's like, Dude, you don't need to drive it home that hard that this guy really is, in all intents and purposes, the Mandarin. I got that already. And then, of course, we have to get that moment where he blatantly screams at Iron Man, I am the Mandarin. It's just like, come on. I mean, comic book movies aren't exactly known for subtlety, but I'm not a freaking mule. You don't have to hit me in the head with a 2 by 4 here. And uh, I will say, though, that the fight between him and Iron Man, that was really pretty pretty cool stuff. I love the bit at the end where Tony, like, and, you know, Aldrich is encased in the Iron Man armor, and then Tony just blows it up. I was like, that was awesome. I did not expect that at all. And, of course, we get this immediately after we see the Iron Man swoop, suit swoop in, clip uh, some piece of metal, and then immediately fall apart around Tony. I mean... That was hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. I love that. That was a brilliant joke. Uh, let's see. Um, I don't know. I kind of felt like the whole explanation of how Aldrich went from really messed up looking dude at the very beginning to, you know, jerk jock 1980s guy, then like five years with the best physical therapist in the world. I mean, okay, we all know that it was really extremist, but it's like, you know, shouldn't somebody have been a little bit more suspicious of that? I mean, eh, come on, dude, you couldn't have come up with something better than that? I, I don't know. It uh, it just felt like they were trying a little too hard to show the such a radical change in the guy, and that they just didn't offer an explanation in-universe that quite sold that. But, again, he was lying, so I suppose it's not really supposed to matter. Uh, let's see. Oh, jeez. Characters. I almost forgot to talk about Rhodey. Okay, so, Rhodey, honestly, as a character, he didn't really have a lot going on. It certainly wasn't where he was sort of at odds to some degree with Tony, like in the last film. Here, it's just sort of... He's other Iron Man, he's out there, he's very competent, he's doing his job, he's very brave, he's got a bit of a sense of humor and all that, but, I mean, there's really nothing going on here. We don't really see anything new for, for Rhodey. We don't really see him go on any kind of character journey. He's just there as a supporting character. And at the end of the day, there's nothing really wrong with that, but 
they could be doing better, and they they really, to me, I think they should have done better. Still, I will give him uh, some credit. The jokes about him, like his pass machine, his password being War Machine Rocks, and you know him and Tony sort of dickering about about the name War Machine versus Iron Patriot. I mean, that was funny stuff, but that just didn't really feel very like very much of it was very ex was exclusively him as a character. Oh yeah, and of course we can't uh, talk about the characters in this movie without ultimately talking about Ben Kingsley's performance as the Mandarin. Now this is a thing that uh, was quite controversial. A lot of people were kind of, you know, really had some serious opinions about whether or not the Mandarin should be played by an Asian person. And of course, Ben Kingsley got cast, so people had to have their say about that. And we all know how discussing race tends to go over on the internet. And then we kind of get a look at his character, and it's obviously this is going to be, in many ways, very different than in the comics. Of course, you know, there are some people who had to have a fit about that. What I really like, well, one of the problems is with the Mandarin is, and uh, the, the fellow that directed it, uh, Shane Black, I believe his name is, he even said there's no real definitive... <laughs> Sorry, like I said, I'm still getting over that cold. There's no real definitive Iron, I'm sorry, Mandarin story in the comics. You know, the Mandarin is just really not that well defined as a villain, at least outside of people who are the really hardcore Iron Man fans. And I even remember the '90s Iron Man cartoon where they went and made him a green alien just to avoid, um, you know, any unfortunate racial implications. So. I can't really kind of blame them for what they did, but the way that um, they did, it ultimately worked out. That Mandarin is really just a puppet. He's a creation of Aldrich Kingsley to sort of just inspire fear. I was like, that's really smart. Given everything that we see of the character before that is revealed, it all makes sense. You know, you can see that he's drawing on these various elements to inspire fear in the American populace, populace and the people of the world. He's doing all these things. You, know, you can see little bits and pieces that are cribbed from various you know, bad guys and dictators and terrorists from, out, from around the world and throughout history. And of course, you know, when it's all comes, like the truth all comes out and it's just Ben Kingsley, I mean, you can tell this guy is like, this is the funniest stuff I have done in forever. He's he's obviously loving being Trevor, and it's it's just really hilarious. I I cannot say enough good things about you know using that as a plot twist. On the other hand, like when you go back, you stop and think about that. When you look about how the Mandarin was before, it's just like, hmm. It sort of does take away um, some of the character's menace. If, I, I would imagine for future repeated viewings. But again, just this being sort of an over the top, you know, media. I mean, he's basically, in a way, a media, a mascot. You know, this really does make that the Mandarin's, you know, I have two more lessons for you, Mr. President. I mean, it really does make sense why he is so over the top if you stop and think about what he ultimately is. Now, let's see. Uh, not to the Marvel Universe in general. Uh, we got a few nice ones. We got, uh, of course, Advanced Idea Mechanics. Very cool. Loved that. You know, AIM or some of my favorite... is AIM is basically my favorite, you know, very nebulous bad guy organization in the Marvel Universe. We also got to see Rocks on Oil, another evil corporation very common in the Marvel Universe. Uh, let me see. Uh, of course, Iron Patriot actually comes from the Avengers comics where he was sort of Spider-Man is enemy Norman Osborn you know had gotten himself to the point where he was a threat to the entire Marvel universe and he well it's a really long story but yeah Norman Osborn was the first Iron Patriot the Green Goblin yeah folks if you're not reading the comics stuff like that happens so I got a really big kick out of seeing that. That I thought was quite cool. And uh, other stuff. Uh, I cannot remember the fellow's name, but the fellow, the guy that played the vice president in this movie. Uh, 
I always, I can't, like I said, I can't remember his name, but I always think of him as either the boss guy on Crossing Jordan or was it? Yeah, Dick Jones from the RoboCop. Like, seriously, it's like, it's Dick Jones from RoboCop. So, you know, what, you know, what can I say, man? RoboCop is a classic. Freaking love RoboCop. So, you know, that was a big treat for me. And I gotta say, like, what ultimately happens, like, sticking the President of the United States in the Iron Patriot armor and, like, putting him out where they're going to, like, literally burn him alive on an oil tanker? I mean, that's... That's so over the top, but it's the sort of over so over the top sort of thing that makes comic books kind of just awesome sometimes. And let's see, what else? Uh, I've already said really everything I had to say about Harley and how I thought I wasn't too big fan, too big of a fan of that part of the movie. Um. Oh yeah, there was one other thing. I was actually reading the BBC, an article about this movie. And one of the other reasons that I think we could maybe think that maybe they didn't want to go with too strong of a Chinese influence in this movie is that one part of this movie was filmed in China. I mean, you can see that in the credits. And what I read is that there was actually um, an additional scene was filmed starring two reasonably well-known Chinese actors to be included specifically in the version of this movie that was released in China. I, they even had the, the premiere of this movie at the Forbidden City in Beijing. And I'm not kidding about this. This is the first Western movie to have ever premiered there. And the thing about this is that China only allows a certain number of Western movies to be screened in its country every year. Because you know, the Chinese Communist Party very, very not big fans of strong Western influence. Now, I actually spent three weeks in China when I was in college. I got to see the Forbidden City and a bunch of other really cool stuff. And, well, three weeks is by no means at all a time to uh, enough time to really make one an expert. If you pay attention, you can start to really see the, um, the level of control that the government exercises there. Uh, when you've got a handler from the Chinese government following you around, uh, you and your group around at all times during the day, yeah, that tells you you ain't, you ain't in Kansas anymore. And, um, as I said, they filmed this additional scenes with um, two well-known Chinese actors. I assume it's stuff involving the hospital, because if you're paying very close attention, you can see that Tony does indeed have that operation in China. You can see Chinese writing on some of the hospital walls. And then if you watch very, very carefully, you can see reflected in the glass the skyline of Shanghai in um, when Tony is, you know, post-operation being able to spend time with Pepper. And if you've never seen a picture of it, this is easy to, to figure out because the skyline of Shanghai is extremely distinctive. Um, as I said, you know, just Google a picture of it. You'll understand what I'm saying. Uh, and I, Shanghai is in one of the places that I saw when I was in China. And I immediately, immediately recognized one of the buildings that you see. Even though it was only on screen for just a couple of seconds, it is unmistakable that that building is in Shanghai. So, yeah, I uh, I don't know really if I have a very good feeling about uh, tinkering with this movie just to please Chinese audiences, but, uh, well, Marvel's a business and it's there to make money, so say la vie, right? Anyway, folks, I think that really covers everything that I have to say about this movie. Um, oh yeah, I, I just should I should give some uh, a credit to uh, the music that's in this film. It's actually done quite good. If you, done quite well. If you pay attention to the credits, you'll notice that is the one and only London Philharmonic uh, turning in another great performance there. But uh, and of course we get the ca the uh, cameo appearance by Bruce Banner at the, the end after the credits. Um, I was kind of hoping for something with a little bit more punch than that, but. It was certainly a fun moment, and I got, and I definitely did like that, uh, the chemistry between Tony and Bruce. It, it certainly is fun to watch these two guys bounce off each other. And just the Bruce is like, I'm not that kind of doctor. It's like, that was great. That was, that was something. That, well, it was actually very reminiscent in some ways of the original Star Trek. But you know, whatever. Anyway, folks, that's all I got for you. Uh, overall, this movie definitely has some flaws, but at the end of the day, it's a really nice way to spend some time. 
very much a worthy addition to the Marvel movie universe. And with that said, folks, I'm going to call it here. As always, please comment, rate, and subscribe. And of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Hoosier Jedi. Until next time, take care and have a good one.